I went to the National Gallery today in Ottawa, where I live, and I looked at Mark Rothko's painting number 16, and I'd like to pick it apart. So this is Nick Picks Apart a Painting, uh, and we're going to talk about Mark Rothko's number 16. That was my theme music. So Mark Rothko is big. He's one of those big guys that uh, if you know art, you've probably heard his name and you've probably seen his rectangles and gone, those are rectangles. Those are big rectangles. This is a big, important painting by a big, important guy. Who cares? And I kind of feel that way. Uh, I look at Mark Rothko and I think this is lazy. It's boring. It's too simple. Uh, get it away from me. But I, I wanted to give it a second chance because I'd read a couple of articles uh, by some arty writers on hyperallergic.com. And I actually like hyperallergic.com and I suggest going and reading the articles that they have there. Uh, but I have to admit, the guys who wrote about Mark Rothko, I don't understand where they're coming from. And that's partly because of the way they write. So for example, one writer said, what's great about Rothko's paintings is the refutation of language, the way they push back against conclusions. And the other writer said, the density apparent in Rothko's work, confusing to some viewers, may also relate to the dialogical encounter between the self and the other, once cited by the existential theologian Martin Buber. So if you read stuff like that, and you go and you look at a painting like this, you feel like an idiot. You look at it and you go, I don't get it. I don't know what those guys are talking about. Uh, am I a moron? What is happening? Uh, and I'm a firm believer that if you go and you look at art, you're entitled to your opinion. You, I, if you don't like country and Western music and you listen to a country and Western music song, you might say, that's dumb. I don't like that. I, I don't want to listen to that song. I don't want to listen to country music. Get it away from me. And some snob might say to you, hey, you need to understand the historical context of that particular song. Uh, country and music, Western music goes back decades. Uh, it has a very time-honored, you know, blah, blah, blah. And, and he can put in historical context that country and Western song for you. He can explain how you missed the subtle nuances or there's a reference in there to, I don't know, some war crimes committed by country and Western music, musicians. And it's, it blows his mind every time he hears it because it's so subtle. And you could go, wow, like that's, that's great. I, I get it. There's a lot of complexity there. I still don't care. And that's kind of how I feel about Mark Rothko. Uh, I look at this painting and I don't care. Um, partly because of the following. I mean, let's, let's actually look at it. It's, there's a big creamy square at the bottom. I guess it's a rectangle, it's not quite a square. And at the top, there's a big creamy rectangle across the top. And separating the two is uh, a, an orange sort of space that's a little more distorted than the orange that actually surrounds the whole thing. And if you look at it really carefully, you can see kind of make out that somebody painted a big creamy rectangle inside an orange square and then said, you know what would be great? We're going to separate this rectangle into two parts by painting an orange band across it that sort of merges in with the other parts. And, you know, we're going to be a little sloppy about it so the creamy bits at the end stick out a little. And, and there we go. So that's, that's the painting. That's, that's, that's what we're looking at. And you can see that it's kind of sloppy. If you look at the edges, you can see that Mark Rothko is just sort of slathered it on. Uh, there's not a lot of um, particular control or effort. It's, it's dripping at the bottom. And so what is he doing? What's, what's this for? What's he trying to say? Mark Rothko actually believes that he's paring down reality to its most basic elements, that he's trying to get rid of all the frivolous details and give you just what's necessary. And I have to admit, it kind of annoys me because I find um, one of the quotes, it's on the little card next to the painting. I advise when you go to an art gallery and you look at art, don't read the card. Look at the painting, see if you have a reaction. If you're completely baffled and you don't know what the heck's going on, you can read the card and get some extra information. But more often than not, I feel like that card is there to tell you, you're stupid, you don't understand. Here's some very important, you know, this is a very important piece of artwork. And you are entirely entitled to just look at it and just go, ugh, or hey, or, you know, and build your own story about what the thing is that you're looking at. But in this particular case, the card talks about how uh, Rothko is trying to uh, destroy illusion so that truth would be revealed. And some of the reading I did about Rothko talks about how he sees this, um, this painting that he's doing, these giant squares, as a kind of mythology. 
and a kind of, uh, of eliminating all the details and making it so that the viewer has to participate and create something themselves instead of just him spoon feeding you the actual meaning of the art. And he, at later in life, he refused to talk about what he was doing. And he just would say, you know, it's up to you. Don't ask me. Uh, I just painted it. Uh, leave me alone. Get away from me. And I actually like abstract art because uh, I, I like to think of it in that term of, of you look at it, you bring your meaning to it, you have to decide what it means. So I look at this painting and I'm like, all right, what, what is going on? There's, there's a square, there's a little rectangle. And I gave them like personalities. I'm like, oh, maybe the big square is the parent and the little square is the child. And this is the parent and the child trying to relate to each other, but they're both empty uh, cold, white voids, full of nothing, and so they have nothing to give to each other, and and there's no relationship. That says more about me than about Mark Rothko, although apparently he was a terrible parent. Uh, I read on some website somewhere. Uh, my parents are pretty terrible too, so I, I, you know, maybe I'm bringing too much of me to this this painting, or maybe. Um, it, you could say that the little square is uh, conscious thought and the bottom square is unconscious thought and this is about that. Or you could say that this is, uh, it's like a Zen circle. Uh, you know those circles that people paint uh, with sumi brushes? It's just a circle and it's, it's supposed to be about inside, outside and, and who's, you know, what's, what's inside of you and what's outside of you is an illusion. And maybe that's what this is, is the white square and the other white square, they look like they're separate, but really they're, they're together and that orange band in the middle has separated them. I mean, the problem with this kind of painting is you can stand here all day and you can come up with 10 billion reasons about what the hell it's supposed to be and what it's all for. But in, in truth, it's, it's entirely make-believe. But Mark Rothko is, is painting giant um, ink blots and you can project as much as you want on them and, and he's not giving you a lot to work with. So if, for example, if you look at an Alex Janvier exhibit, uh, which is at the National Gallery right now. If you look at some of his paintings, there's a lot to work with. There's a lot of complexity. There's a lot of squiggles. There's a lot of play. There's a lot of joy and happiness. And it's like, hey, viewer, look at all of this. You can, oh, we're, you know, there's stuff to work with here. It's great. But then you come back to the Mark Rothko and you're like, dude, like, give me something. Give me something to do. This is just so, and maybe that's what that, you know, that guy in hyperallergic.com is talking about where it's like the the self and other where it's like you know what i'm not where mark rothko's like i'm not going to give you a goddamn thing you don't get anything from me you figure it out it's all on you all i'm doing is i'm painting this stuff and i don't know i mean it just it doesn't work for me i find it too pared down there's there's art is illusion you can't get rid of the illusion and say there now now that's truth when if you know if you want to get really truthful uh, and get away from illusion, don't pick up a paintbrush. Because the first thing you're going to do when you start painting is paint illusion. Because there's no, if you look at a landscape and you see all those little trees and things and the little fawn and, and, and the sky and birds and things, none of that's really there. That's an illusion. It's, it's paint on canvas. Somebody did some representational stuff. So effectively, Mark Rothko, because to me, when I look at this, He's primed the canvas. When is he going to start painting? He's painted this big white space. Is he going to put something in there? Uh, is he, is, are there going to be trees? Is there going to be birds? Is there like when's he going to start putting something in there uh, instead of just giving me this big empty white space? And that's that's part of my frustration with this kind of work. And and I mean, if you look at other Rothkos, they're not they're not these big white spaces. There's all these different colors, and there's vibrations between the different colors. Because if you put red on top of green or blue on top of orange, there'll be a sort of vibration with the two colors fighting each other. But I'd I'd say that overall, uh, it's just squares on on a colored background, and you can stare at it until you find some meaning you can go oh the the big mean daddy square is is uh is sexually abusing the little white square or is you know is demeaning the little white square uh and they have this tension between them that's a slightly different colored orange and you could say that's what's going on but i mean that's just as likely as saying that uh it's an iceberg and it's a little broken piece of an iceberg and this is about global warming uh which it is not mark rothko died in 1970. so Overall, I would say I'm, I'm not a fan of Mark Rothko's work. Uh, I hate this particular painting. I gave it a shot. 
I still don't understand what the hyperallergic.com guys are, but I, I still respect them, even though I think that they, they're they kind of delusional in their own way. But I, I also believe, I've had a friend who said uh, he hated my poetry and that it wasn't real poetry because uh, it's, it didn't even rhyme. And I my joke with him was, well, it's a big world, and I didn't realize that there was only so many words and that we could only have so many types of poetry. And, and the same goes for Mark Rothko. If, if you like this stuff, great. If you don't, uh, you're with me, <laughs> and, and that's totally allowed. Uh, but, you know, if people want to like Mark Rothko, great. Uh, just don't make me pay, you know, $9 million for a Mark Rothko, because these things are, you know, pricey, to say the least. Anyway, that's, uh, that's all I have to say about this crap, and next video I'll say some crap about some other crap, because, or maybe, maybe it'll even be good. I don't want to pick on everybody in a bad way. I'll, I'll try to find some art I like, too. Thanks for watching. Uh, if you like this, and, and why wouldn't you like this, uh, you can go to my uh, blog, uh, stopbeingsane.com, where I have uh, crazy comic strips and uh, weird fiction, some opinion pieces and other nonsense, and um, you can watch me slowly disintegrate into nothing. Thanks. Bye.